also going to touch on quite a bit of like artistic traditions, um, culture, and religion. So I just wanted to give you guys a clear, clear picture of where we're going. And with that, let's take a, a look here at this beautiful image of a three-headed bearded snake. And this is from the tomb of the infernal Quadria, and it's from the fourth century BCE. Um, and we will talk more about these curious bearded snakes later on in the presentation. What I'll be covering is, I'm gonna start off just setting context. What timeline are we talking about? What's the location we're looking at? I'll go into more specific period milestones for each of the significant chunks of time. I'll talk about also the government, what we know about the government. Um, spiritual beliefs is a, a very important part of um, uh, Etruria. Um, and that will also include death or to death do us part. Artistic and architectural tra traditions are something that I'll touch on as well. And then I'll just basically leave you with some questions rather than some answers. So diving in at that 30,000 foot level view for those of us that remember flying back in the good old days, right? So if we look at what is happening uh, conceptually here, the timeline is roughly a thousand years of quote, Etruscan and Villanovan culture. It starts off, uh, Firstly, in the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, around 1200 BCE, uh, give or take hundreds of years, and it is designated the Proto-Villanovan culture. The Villanovan culture officially will be identified around 900 BCE and last for almost 200 years. And it is so called the Villanovan culture after um, a, a cache of artifacts that are found um, in the town of Villanova or a location called Villanova in Italy. Like the, the Greeks, um, scholars have a kind of chunk, chunkified the time periods um, into the Orientalizing period in which there is a large uh, Greek and Near Eastern influence in the uh, Etruscan culture. We also have an archaic period, which when we look at some of the objects, um, we'll see that there is a lot of mirroring of archaic trends from Greece. The, what I'm calling, and some I've seen some people call it crisis, I've seen others call it a classical uh, period, I'm calling it rough times is from about 480 to 323 BCE. And this is a time period when um, Etruria is undergoing a lot of um, cataclysmic change. There's a lot of movement that's going on that's not in their favor as a culture. And then lastly, we'll, we'll end on the Hellenizing and Romanizing period when um, Etruria and Etruscans are starting to become um, part of Roman culture. The zenith or apex of the Etruscan culture is between the 7th and 6th centuries BCE. So, to give you a sense of the, the borders of the Etruscan culture, so their heartland was really in this area here, which is roughly, you know, like central, central western Italy. It also included Elba, which when I look at the next slide, uh, will become uh, more important um, in terms of wh what your understanding of it is. They do expand all the way into the Po River Valley area and set up a couple of port cities along the Adriatic coast. And then there's expansion down into Campania here in the south. They also will um, basically manage or oversee lead Corsica as part of their largest expansion. Um, if everybody could go on mute, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, Can I ask a quick question. Yes, Mark. The um, so with this expansion, is this a centralized kingdom or many kingdoms? Um, so uh, that is a. That's a great question and I will get into their government, but basically the Etruscans are not like, say like a Roman um, 
a Roman authority, right, where there is like a centralized, quote, emperor or king. It is what I kind of look at as comparable to Greek polis or city states. Um, so there is there are alignments between certain cities, uh, city states, but there's not this overarching. This was the king of Etruria. Okay. And I will go into more detail, um, Mark, on that. Uh, you're just giving me a little bit uh, in advance of me. And so one thing that I found really curious as I was looking at this map, just not knowing, having a lot of familiarity with Italy, was that, you know, why is it that the Adriatic Sea, which is, you know, looking at a map, looks closer to Greece, right? Um, which is a, a trading partner with Etruria. And um, what you see on a map, which you can't see in here, is that the App Appenine um, mountain range on the eastern side is extremely steep and drops off rather suddenly, making this coast very inhospitable in ancient times for uh, like boats or ports. So that is why you see this real big concentration of ports um, along the western and the, the western Mediterranean Tyrrhenian Sea. So going into giving at a high level, going into some key developments by period. During the this Villanovan period, 900 to 720 BCE, roughly, what we see emerging is social stratification. So there is the emergence of an elite class of individuals. And how the scholars have determined this is based on the differentiation in burials, right? So you've got burials that are very simple, and then you've got burials that are becoming more and more um, elaborate and including um, a greater level of grave goods. Um, the Villanovan um, peri period is also a time, and the Proto-Villanovan period is also a time when the uh, people were practicing what is practicing burial within urns. So it was largely a culture that uh, cremated the remains of the dead and buried them in these wonderfully artistically decorated pots, which are absolutely beautiful uh, and all. And so they were like, I think, so the Celts and Germanic tribes considered part of an urn field culture. Another thing that's happening is there is an expansion in population. We have population growth. There is noted trade with Sardinia based on the finds from both um, the cultures in each other's locations. And then we have the representation of the human figure. This is one of the first Villanovan representations of a human that we have. And if you could just make out here, we have a couple of what appear to be like stick people. So they're very schematically represented. It, it appears that they are seated on something. Maybe this is a, a, a bench and they're facing each other. It's not known what this represents um, graphically, but it is a funerary urn. Another thing that's coming out of the Villanovan period is expertise in bronze working. And we'll see why that is. So if we look at, at kind of the early origins of, you know, who are these Villanovans? Who are these people that become the Etruscans? Well, what I can leave you with is kind of more questions. There are three um, origin theories that are more or less mainstream. The most popular is that they are Neolithic immigrants from uh, Central Europe. That's the most popular theory. A secondary theory is that they are actually indigenous it Italic peoples. Um, the problem with that theory is that um, the language of the Etruscans is completely unrelated to any of the Italic or even Indo-European languages. Um, and then the third is uh, that they were Lydian immigrants, so coming over from um, Western Anatolia. And the only um, evidence really is, I, I believe it was Herodotus, the ancient historian, uh, so there's not a lot of support that they were actually Lydian immigrants. However, when we look at some of the archaeological material that remains, we do see that there is a large amount of culture that's coming in 
outside of just the strictly Villanovan culture, and that includes Greek, uh, Greece, it includes Egypt, it includes the Near East. So the, everyone is, is not 100% bought into who these people really were. Um, and there's a lot of genetic testing that's being conducted right now, and it's starting in the year 2000. And even that evidence uh, seems to give different results depending on who's doing the test. So that's still an open question. Another thing that uh, is happening during this period is in you know spiritual beliefs, and and what we have here is a really interesting find, and it was what they can the archeologists think is probably the first sacred burial that is affiliated with these Villanovan Etruscan peoples. Um, it appears to be the burial of an epileptic boy and they think he was ep epileptic by the base, uh, the shape of his skull. There were also the skeletons of newborns. What makes this burial unique is that they were inhumed as opposed to being cremated. Um, they were buried near a naturally occurring cavity in the earth, which is the only one that has been identified to date. And I ask for you to kind of put a pin in this because I'm going to come back to that burial site and this burial boy. Um, there was also evidence of a hut that was erected near the burial. Um, and it appears that this um, individual or group of individuals was venerated generation after generation and possibly sacrifices of animals and newborns were performed um, at this site. In terms of wealth sources here, um, the Etruscans were unique compared to the other people within the um, Italian peninsula in that they, they had a level of wealth that was not seen by others. And this map really shows the reason why. All of this area is within the Etruscan, basically their heartland. And there is an immense amount of wealth in ancient times there from metals that included iron and tin and copper and silver. Uh, and um, iron, excuse me, copper and tin were the two you know, pieces of the puzzle you needed to make bronze. So they were extremely wealthy. I mean, they exploited it and did an excellent job of maintaining their control over those sites. They were also very good at sea trade and they were excellent merchants like the Phoenicians. Um, they also had very fertile soil from volcanic activity. Uh, and so they were uh, producers of wine and grapes and grain, which I believe is called farro, um, was the type of grain that they, they ate a lot of. Uh, and then one thing that I do want to point out, and this kind of speaks to what Mark had asked about in terms of like, you know, was there a king of Etruria? Um, and in um, Villanovan and early uh, Etruscan history, trade was really managed um, like their city states on a regional level or a city state level. Um, so individual cities were vying for control um, over, uh, you know, resources as well as um, sea trade and all. And then, you know, where our evidence is coming from in terms of these early origins, we have references from ancient writers, including Herodotus and Strabo and Thucydides, um, are some of them, but there are many others. Uh, there was also a um, excavations that have been done around an archaic Etruscan settlement on the island of Lemnos, a Greek island that were there. And then of course, from their archeological remains. What you'll see missing from this is that there is no text that's been written by the Etruscans saying, this is who we are, this is what we believed, this is how we managed ourselves. We don't have anything like that. We have only external sources that have written about the Etruscans in terms of text. They do have texts, which I'll get to, but um, they haven't written about their quote history. Um, we know um, in some of the ancient texts that um, some of them, especially the Greeks, Called, the, called them Tyrrhenians Tyrini because of their location along the Tyrrhenian Sea and their control over Tyrrhenian trade. 
They are also referred to by some, Strabo included, as pirates, and they had a poor reputation. Now you kind of have to weigh that with a grain of salt, like whenever anybody is writing about another culture, uh, right? Uh, they probably wouldn't have written about themselves this way. Lisa, quick question. Yes. yes. Were they in Corsica and Sardinia too? Or I mean, were they remains there too? Yes, yes, they were, um, they were active on Corsica. Now, I don't know about any kind of like burials or archaeological remains, but there is evidence that they were active on Corsica at their, at their greatest expansion. Now, moving out of the Villanovan period and into a, the periods where we have like what is considered to be identifiable Etruscan um, culture, and it starts with this orientalizing period. Um, they are controlling the Tyrrhenian sea trade. They are have great influence from Greece as well as the Near East. And if we just take a, a closer look at this beautiful bronze, right? This we can if we just zoom in here, we can see these looked like um, winged horses or goats, possibly, which is more sphinx-like, maybe Egyptian, maybe Near Eastern. And then we have these wonderful, um, what are they, pro protomes, these bronze griffin head attachments, um, which is ex very Near Eastern in its, its style. There is the development of local pottery traditions, um, which we will take a look at in more detail. And we also, during this time, see a reflection of how um, archaeologists believe their domestic architecture looked based on some of their tombs. Because the Etruscans, like some other cultures, like the Neolithic culture on Malta, for instance, they would create these elaborate um, mirrors or reflections of their living world in their um, funerary architecture. Um, and the Etruscans were very skilled at that. There is again, like along the lines of greater and greater social stratification happening, the emergence of monumental tombs, which require the work of many um, individuals. Um, and some of them were slaves and some of them were servants, um, but they were working for an aristocratic class to build these tombs. Uh, we also see that there's quite a bit of gender equality. And we see that because of the burials of women and they are given the, um, the same amount of space. They're given elaborate tombs, just like their partners. The women maintain their names, um, both a family name as well as their first name. So they don't you know, become Julia when they marry Julius. You know, or Claudia when they marry Claudius, they um, maintain their names. There's also a lot of evidence um, in some of the archaeological record and wall paintings, for instance, of women having a great amount of freedom and liberty outside of the home. So they were active participants in Etruscan society, um, which is very different from Greece. And in fact, Greek writers, a number of them, really looked down upon the Etruscans and found that they were immoral. And some of that had to do with the fact that women were allowed greater liberty in society than were the Greek women. The other thing that emerges during this time is writing, which it's thought is uh, basically an import with a lot of variation, um, but originally coming in from Euboean. Not sure I'm saying that correctly, Euobian um, Greek settlers that had settled in Italy and brought with them writing. Please, Language. Can I just uh, sorry. Uh, add something yes. quick? I don't yes. know if you're going to get to that. First, first time I mentioned, I don't know if it's really a mention, but there are the people of the sea that attacked Thebes or um, Egyptians, they actually mentioned uh, Etruscans uh, and collapse of the bronze. Uh, period as well. I'm not going to get that. That that was an interesting. No. Also, um, what would they? Um, what were they called in the 
the text that we have from because I don't recall that the Etruscans were were mentioned. Yeah, but... Etrus, I don't remember. I think there was there was saying that people the task is is okay. I think it's referred to the Etruscans and uh -huh. the area of Sicily that okay. Uh, those, oh, know, this is I knew about you know, the Sicilians, I, I, but I not the Etruscans. Is. What that is is uh, the the uh, sea peoples are attested by two. Uh, Egyptian pharaohs, I think Ramesses IV and Merneptah, both talking about battles that they had against the sea peoples, and then they enumerate the tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's been a, an effort by scholars over hundreds of years to say, okay, who are these people? So one of the tribes was the Sickles. They're supposed to be native Sicilians. Um, uh, but uh, I think that that in general at this point, the, the consensus is that you really don't know who they are or where they're from, and there's no way to to conclusively say anything about them because they're not attested anywhere except in these uh, stele, uh, victory stele of the pharaohs in Egypt celebrating. They said the people came, blah, 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 and that's it. Yeah. So. It's, it's not clear at all that they were Etruscans or Sardinians or anything else. Yeah. Th yeah, thank you for that. I think that there was the whole, the Jackers, there was like a whole list of, right. of peoples that were that were listed out. I just didn't I put it together that maybe they could have been um, Etruscan. And yeah, and, but, so. you know, and scholars have been guessing and then as scholars have gotten a little more skeptical and saying, you know, what's the proof? Yeah. You know, they, they most of those things have been blown out of the water. Yeah. Well, anyways, we have work to do, people. We have to find that reference to, to figure out who the sea pupils were, right? Um, okay, moving on. Um, so we talked about monumental gender, right? Okay, writing. All right, let's get on to what we know about their their actual language and all. Well, we don't know a whole heck of a lot. Um, it's unrelated to Latin, non-Indo-European. I believe it's would be considered a language um, isolate like Basque, for instance. Uh, so we don't really understand the origins um, or can trace the roots. There are not a lot of texts that remain. There are a lot of fragments that remain. Um, and the fragments that are available um, or have been found are ritual, funerary, epigraphic, or transactional in nature. The writing sometimes, I don't think it does it all the time, is uh, uses a system called Bustrophedon, which is as the ox plows. So for those unfamiliar with it, you know, if you write left to right, the ox plow would circle around and go right to left, and then go back left to right and right to left. Um, there are between 10,000 and 16,000 fragments. Um, and again, they're extremely brief. And the lexicon is incomplete. So what this um, does in terms of a challenge is that scholars are having to use different methods to understand the language. Uh, there is not any um, like um, Behustun inscription. There is not the Rosetta Stone um, for the Etruscan language. So what they look at is not only the symbols that are written down, but the syntax, um, the context, the materials um, and if they're able to identify any proper names. You know, I think to sum it up is that uh, scholars, lexicographers, they know how they wrote, but not really what they wrote. So a lot of these translations, you know, have many question marks around them because they're just not confident in the translations. So let's take a look at what Etruscan actually looks like. And I believe the Etruscan is on the left-hand side. Uh, actually, I'm not 100% sure. So if anybody knows, I'm not 100% sure which one it was. Um, but what the we're looking at are- like Greek. The right one looks like Greek, the left one probably. Which one? The right one looks like Greek, the left one. Yeah, probably. okay. Um, so, what we're looking at are inscribed gold sheets, uh, and these are from the fifth century BCE. There were, oops, uh, the, originally there were three of these, uh, and there still are three of them. I could only fit two of them on there. Uh, but what makes them so interesting and um, what scholars had really pinned their hopes on is that 
one of them is in Phoenician and the other two are in Etruscan. And so they were hoping, oh, maybe this is gonna be our like Rosetta Stone, you know, but the, the um, context is similar, but the, um, but they do actually tell a little bit of a different um, story. So it's not a one-to-one -one translation. Uh, what these gold sheets um, detail is a dedication by an aristocrat of a temple to the goddess Uni, which is their, like their, their Juno or their Astarte, Phoenician Astarte. And it is the oldest epigraphic source from Etruria. Um, and yeah, that's, that's about it for, for their writing. And I want to sh just do one uh, other thing that I'll get to it in just a moment, a little surprise for you. Uh, the cross-pollination with Greece, Phoenicia, and Egypt is very, very important to Etruscan culture. There is a lot of influence and a lot of importing that's going on. They're taking such things as luxury items um, like ostrich eggs and gold and ivory from Egypt. They love, love Greek pottery, especially Greek pottery from Athens. Uh, and they're also importing amber from the Baltic and fashioning jewelry out of it. Uh, artistic motifs like that uh, bronze lebes that we took a look at um, earlier on um, is coming from like the Near East as well as Egypt and Greece. We have religious influences that are coming over from Greece and the Near East. Um, and later we'll see a little bit of an Egyptian influence as well. And they're also importing scented oils. What they're exporting is a lot around the metals. They have raw metals that they export, but then they're also exporting a great deal of finely worked objects, especially in bronze. And so, um, so wonderful were they at bronze working that there are even votive offerings that are found throughout Greece in temples uh, because they were very prized. They also have a very distinct type of pottery called vukero, which we'll take a look at shortly. Um, Yes. Oh, sorry, I was looking. I was looking for um, um, uh, a spot there. Um, how is an ostrich egg a, a luxury item? Would it, what would it be covered in gold or? I mean, would, could, you, are there any examples? They, oh, you know, I wish I had included a photo. But um, have you ever seen um, like a carved ostrich egg? That Not was carved. that was a, that okay, was an artistic. It was an artistic. Um, a just incredible achievement, but they would be a car carved um, ostrich eggs. Like scrimshaw, in a way. Uh, I don't know what scrimshaw is. Oh, when well, you take um, uh, like whale bones or um, oh. and uh, um, and you carve something into it. Yeah, maybe. But pretty, it's. I've seen a couple of examples just in photos. I've never seen a real one and all, but they're absolutely beautiful. That I've seen. Uh, and then the other thing is just in terms of like general exports, um, they you know, um, made wine, uh, there were olives, there was grain that farro and pine nuts were other exports that they um, would give out to people. So during the archaic period, 580 to 480 BCE, what I think the big takeaway here is that there was a focus on quote, I'm calling it loosely infrastructure, what they're doing is they're moving to cities, they're building up cities, there's urbanization that's happening, there are roads and bridges. The Romans are definitely excellent superior road builders. But the Etruscans as well are doing quite a bit of road um, building and in fact there are some images of these wonderfully carved roads through tufa, which is volcanic um, stone. Um, where they carve directly through it. And there are actually the ruts of the wheels that you can see over the centuries of you know, using these roads. They also do wooden bridges. And there's the emergence of currency to be used instead of just barter and trade for goods. There's a change in the way that their military is formed um, and it's called, referred to as a hoplite military, but it is nothing like that of Greece. Greece was very um, structured, it was organized. Um, the Etruscans did not have that kind of approach to the military. Again, they are more city-state based as opposed to being like a larger um, cultural or um, political entity. Um, but they do um, 
develop um, like some of the, uh, I guess, arm, armor and weaponry that you will see in a typical hoplite military. And in fact, I think some of their um, greatest bronze works are actually helmets um, and shields that are exported um, to Greece. There is the emergence of the Emporia, and the Emporia is basically their mall. And these are being set up along the, the port cities of the Tyrrhenian Sea Coast, and all where people are coming to basically do their trade, buy goods, sell goods. Uh, and there is um, quite a number of um, foreign names that are present in the Emporia. So there were quite a number of um, non-native Etruscans that were um, buying and selling in the Emporia. There is a change um, in terms of the economy that's happening here. I talked about in the Orientalizing period that there was the emergence of these really big tombs and the aristocracy um, is using people labor to build those monumental tombs. Here we have some, something different happening. We have the emergence of tombs that are more middle class, basically. These are kind of like the, the house, the military housing that used to exist close to where I live. You know, they're of like equal structure. Um, they were no more elaborate, less elaborate than their neighbors and all. Um, and we see the, the middle class starting to identify less with a, an aristocratic family and more along the lines of where did they kind of have their, their leadership beliefs, you know, more along the lines of perhaps like a, a plebeian versus a, a patrician um, kind of alignment that's happening here. Liz, it's Ada. Can I ask a quick yes. question? Yes, please. What did they consider middle class back then? So I think what's what they're considering middle class is that these are people that are starting to have um, their own like businesses, little, little yeah. businesses. Okay. Little little businesses, for instance, we see that there is um, less of a, these are people that work for an aristocratic family um, and more of kind of a balancing out. So you still had people that had very elaborate tombs, but you're having fewer of those people and you're having more of these um, middle class burials that are happening. And then you have people that are still being buried in a very, very simple fashion. So I believe that that's how they're kind of qualifying that there were, you know, a slave and servant um, class, then there was a middle class and then an aristocratic class. Lisa, also, yes. I think if you have roads, I mean, people had to travel through the roads and it, so there was exchange of things. So I think that's a middle class too. Mm, okay, good point. Good point. Right. Thank you for that. Um, Moving on then to conflict that's happening during the archaic period that's taking place in the Mediterranean. What we have happening is the arrival of the um, Greek Phocians. Um, and what they're doing is they're trying to raid and gain territory, um, take it away from the Etruscans along the, the very important um, metal centers and port centers. Um, they interrupt the sea trade in the Tyrrhenian Sea. Um, Etruria and Carthage. Carthage is very active during this time period as well. And they um, al ally themselves to pose a counter attack to the, um, the Phocians. Um, there is a battle that takes place in the Sardinian Sea in 540 BCE and they're able to repel the, the Phocians. Um, but there's still some disruption. The sea trade in that area, um, it doesn't kind of, um, go back to the way it was before the Phocians had come in. Um, and it also disrupted a kind of trade that was happening all the way down in Southern Italy in Campania. There is the expansion um, in the North that's happening. So if you remember that, that map that I was showing at this time, there are settlements that are emerging along the Po River Valley, as well as a couple of ports along the Adriatic um, coast. And that's gonna become important, especially in their next period here. And then lastly, we have um, the, the Tarquins and the Kings of Rome. Um, and we have the expulsion of the Tarquins that's happening during this period, which I will talk about in just a moment here. Um, 
let me just take a second here. Yes, for the, so when the uh, Etruscan kings, um, and I thank you, Paul, for that wonderful article you sent over to me. But when the Etruscan kings and the basically the the, the monarchy, the kingship, um, is ousted from Rome in 509 BCE, there it is true that the the leaders, the Tar Tarquins, that were kings, are expelled from Rome. However, the aristocracy remains in Rome. So Etruscans that were aristocratic from aristocratic families, they remain in Rome. They don't have to leave Rome. So now we're moving on to what I'm calling the rough times period in the fourth and at the fifth to fourth centuries BCE. This is when officially the Tyrrhenian trade um, is lost um, to, uh, to um, the Syracusans, I believe and um, the Etruscans no longer control that. Uh, it takes place um, during a battle with um, Gelon of Syracuse. The Etruscans lose. Uh, the Sicilians also defeat the Carthaginians, who again were allies of the Etruscans. So sea power shifts quite a bit during this time. Additionally, uh, the brother of Gelon, Hieron, pushes onto mainland Italy and actually starts attacking key Etruscan trade ports some 20 years later. Another thing that's happening is, uh, or as a result of all of that loss of control of that sea trade, is economic decline in the south. Um, we do see the South is starting to um, drop off in terms of its imports. However, what will continue in the South is their incredible metalworking that um, is still going to become, is still going to be a sought after um, goods from both other city states within Etruria, but also outside of Etruria. Greece is, is wanting to get their hands on these beautiful works that the, this part of Etruria produces. In the north, what we see happening is prosperity, actually. Things kind of shift. Uh, and we see a lot of coinage is in circulation. Um, the importing of Attic pottery that was happening in the south really shifts up to the north in the Adriatic ports. So Athenian pottery is still being imported into Etruscan territory, but just in a different part of Etruria. Uh, and the north is also responsible for importing a lot of bronze objects from central and southern Etruria. And there's also a time when, uh, even though there's all this prosperity in the north, there are walls being erected around the cities. There is social tension that's mounting, and I guess I would kind of liken it to um, the emergence of Greek tyrants kind of overthrowing the city-state um, aristocracy and more um, plebeians that are leading um, the city-states now we do see that aristocratic leadership is losing their kind of toehold on ruling these city-states. But this is speculative. Um, it's not, I haven't seen anything that's conclusive there. It's also a time when the Gauls are coming in from the north into Italy. And now the Gauls had been immigrating generation after generation into Etruria. So they're not new here. Um, but they are actually starting to use Etruria as a staging place to sack Rome, which is what they will do. They'll sack Rome um, and they will, um, when they're fleeing, because they just want to take the booty and like leave, they're going back through Etruria. Um, they also attack the Etruscan city of Chusi or Cusi. Um, they are repelled or um, basically stopped when they uh, went head to head with an Etruscan army from Cerveteri. And actually Cerveteri has a very interesting relationship, a very close relationship with Rome. And it is thought that Rome, when they were under siege or about to be sieged by the Gauls, sent their Vestal Virgins and treasure to Cerveteri for safekeeping during that tough period for them. So very interesting um, relationship there. Uh, Rome, yes, have... please, Greg. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious why uh, 
gold wouldn't be attacking the major Etrurian cities. Why they were uh, the Rome? I don't think Rome was the bigger, the more powerful. Greg, we can barely hear. Can you repeat the question? And yeah, we'll... you're, you're. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Up. That's much better now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying. It seems that the Rome at the time we're talking about the fourth century BC uh, was not a, a much richer and bigger city than other Etrurian cities, and and why uh, uh, gold spared those Etrurian cities. I just wonder, was there any ideas about that? So I, I do not know because you raise a really good point um, because all of that metal and those mines were, you know, in Etr Etruscan territory. So why not attack there? I don't know. Does anybody on the call know? Any Gauls on the call? <laughs> I, I, well, I'm half French, so maybe that counts. Uh, the, 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 the only reason I can think of is that mines are not useful in, uh, at plundering because you have to take the stuff out and you've got ore and has to be processed. So there's probably not a, I mean, when you have a silver mine, you're not, sil you're not mining, uh, you're not taking bars of silver out of the rock. So it, it, you know, it's not, there's not a concentration of, of, of metals there. That'd yeah, be my guess. yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. I'm writing that down. I already have two pieces of homework from you guys, so this is good. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Okay. Hopefully, um, we'll we'll get shed some light on it. I'm, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, I am curious now. I'm really curious too. Uh, and then just as we, I think we know um, the, you know, Rome uh, bounces back pretty quickly after the Gauls sack Rome. And what we see happening at this time is there is a greater, greater um, Roman encroachment into Etruria. Um, and there is the start of wars with cities in Etruria. And all. Now, I call it the rough times period. And this is a time when they are going through a lot of change. But then I look at this beautiful sculpture, this head, and I think, was it so bad? You know, they're still producing this wonderful um, artistic uh, you know, um, work. So um, it's just, it's very interesting. It's kind of a uh, different, different things are happening in different places. There was certainly something different about her eyes. Yes. So if we look at this just very briefly, so she is, you know, having some of the elements of uh, maybe what may be considered classical sculpture in Greece, you know, more realistic features, softer features, um, she's got these beautiful almond shaped eyes. Um, it's just, it's a beautiful piece. Yeah. yeah, actually, since before you thought we talked about the language, uh, from what uh, I, I remember, yeah, it is very interesting. It's uh, 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 the Etruscan uh, language is one of those three in the European. Sorry, sorry Greg, to in, sorry to interrupt you, but it's a little hard. Still having uh, a hard oh, time. Oh, yeah. How about now? Better. Now it's Thank good. You. Yeah, I have to hold it closer. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah uh, the, uh, what, uh, the language, the Etruscan language is what they call uh, Paleo European, which is a pre Indo European language. Mm. Uh, and uh, there are very few of those left in Europe, like a Basque language is the other one. But uh, it, there is a, what I read, an interesting uh, theory which doesn't conflict with what you were saying. Uh, and, and I think because the, the similar language is on the island of Lemnos, uh, which is right next to the cherry, uh, to the uh, uh, Anatolia. So the main theory is probably that the major migration of Anatolian farmers in about six to seven thousand BC is into the Central Europe, and maybe eventually is probably the prevailing one uh, eventually into the northern in Italy. It seems like a more, most uh, acceptable from what I know. Um, and that's how the language uh, is uh, related to those um, uh, uh, lemnos uh, languages in Anatolia. It, it, interesting, at least in terms of the um, the sources that I was using, they do mention that there is there was a um, an archaic um, Etruscan settlement on Lemnos that then 
left at some point in time. Um, so I don't know if they're, you know, that's kind of piggybacking on what, what you're saying or. Yeah, what I'm saying is that they, they may not have been at Russians at the time. They were just like mm -hmm. part of the general uh, uh, migration of Anatolian farmers that happened uh, in, in that period between yeah. uh, six and 9,000 BC, I think, uh, mm -hmm. into the Europe and uh, influenced everything. And, and they brought those um, uh, Paleo-European uh, languages that were later on most of them were substituted by Indo-European uh, migration from that uh, Pontic Caspian area. That, uh, area. Uh, so, uh, and, but, but also, uh, uh, I wonder which part of them that they were hunter gatherers there before they had language too. <laughs> I just wonder if it's that yeah. mix of that. Immigration and language. Yeah. Okay. All right. Another thing I'm having to write down. This is great. Lots of homework, Greg, you're giving me lots of homework. <laughs> so thank you for that. All right, um, moving on. Now this is the interactive part. Um, and so I just wanna ask, does anybody know what it is that we're looking at right here? Looks like Greek. No. It, no. It, lo it looks. I know I'm I'm I know I'm wrong, but it looks like um, Hebrew, writing right? okay. from uh, Roman soldiers on the um, the on Hadrian's wall. They wrote oh. on on thin pieces of wood. Okay. And they, like they started in, in under you know un, under a non oxygenated earth. So, but anyway, okay. I, I, I knew Alrighty. I, I knew it I'm looks wrong. it's it, it looks like somebody wrote on bricks on walls, but okay. Not oh, good. you guys now now. Nobody gets the like wins a prize for this. What uh -oh. we're looking at is linen. This oh, is I actually was gonna, I was gonna say that, Lisa. Oh, textile. All right. Okay. Well, I'll give you the prize then. Okay. Um, what, what prize? Right. The prize. I know. I got to think of it really fast. Okay. So I will. I will think of something. Um, but basically, this is the mystery of the mummy, um, and I love this this story. It is actually the longest Etruscan text, and it's 1,600 words, they think, and it was found on the linens wrapped around a mummy, um, which I just think is absolutely fascinating. So this mummy is from the Ptolemaic um, period, and also we're talking about later um, in BC, BCE, I think it's fourth to first century um, BCE. Um, is and what, what's that? Is it Coptic? No, this is Etruscan. Oh. This is the Etruscan language that's written here, which is what makes it so fascinating. It's like, okay, so we know that there was exchange between Egypt and Etruria, but how, why is this mummy found in Egypt wrapped in linens that contain Etruscan ritual calendar? Hey Lisa? And, uh, yes. Uh, um, uh, you mentioned before the, kind of at the top of the presentation that Phoenician, it was not an Indo-European language. How- No, not Phoenician, Etruscan. I'm sorry, 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 yeah. sorry. Etruscan, yes. Yeah. Uh, is that highly unusual for that uh, for that to be? I know um, uh, Basque is non uh, non Indo European, but I, I don't know about the other languages at that time in Europe. Where is it unusual for Etruscan to be non um, Indo European? As I understand it, yes. Okay, so we're a bit of an island in that sense. Yeah, yeah. They would call, they I saw it referred to as a language isolate. Yeah, even so Hitans were Indo-European language, and they predate Etruscans by how many years? So that's that's to me, you know, obviously an interesting aspect. Uh, yeah, I might know. The Indo-Europeans were presumably nomadic horsemen who swept across from uh, southern Russia, the cent or the steppes of southern Russia or Central Asia, and really swept fairly quickly across all of Europe, uh, and just completely took over everything and imposed their language and religion uh, throughout Europe. Um, just leaving a few of these little isolated islands. I suppose the biggest non-Indo-European is the uh, Finnish um, 
Finnish, Estonian, Sami, and Magyar, which is another non-Indo-European family. Uh, but yeah, this was this was just a small island, a bit like Basque. But otherwise, all of Europe from uh, the British Isles to Spain, Italy is all Indo-European. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ralph. Yeah. Oh, and, they, and so they started out, I guess they started out around 3,000. By 2,000, they'd, they'd pretty much swept through Europe by about 2,000, some, uh, and I guess continuing in waves. So the Celtic waves or the Gauls was apparently sort of the earliest wave that went furthest west and ended up being a little isolated in Scotland and Ireland. The Germanic tribes then followed them, and then the Slavic tribes followed them. Um, so, yeah, I guess by 2000, I think by about 2000, or certainly by 1500, most of Europe was into European speaking. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Ralph. Um, just as a note, Zach, I think it would be fascinating if it hasn't already been presented, language you know, like distribution of language, history of like language distribution. Ralph, how about that? Oh yeah, <laughs> I know, I'm yeah, like Ralph. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah, Ralph. Ralph, yeah, that's, thank, thanks very much, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So um, just going over uh, the things quickly here. So um, they, um, there are images, I suppose, that have been found on wall paintings of such a like a book, this or this ritual calendar on Etruscan wall paintings and also on some of the sarcophaguses. You know, but this is the only one that's ever been found and preserved. Um, it's also Lisa, interestingly Lisa, enough. Lisa, the, where was the mummy found? The mummy was found in Egypt. Now, in where Egypt. in Egypt, I um, do not know. Okay, but it was in Egypt, it was not in Etruria. It was in Egypt, correct, right? Um, it's the only Etruscan artifact that has been found um, in Egypt um, out of everything. You, here they were great bronze workers. Here they, were, they also had uh, uh, people that saw some of their pottery um, and, and no other artifacts are found from Etruria in Egypt. And it, it dates to between fourth and first centuries. One would, one would think that the most reasonable explanation would be, a, a, you know, an, an Etrurian individual is, tra it, is, is trans, you know, is, is uh, in some way transported to Egypt and gets any, and he writes these things, uh, you know, uh, on linen there. Yeah. May, you know, that, what is it, Oxum's razor, the simplest, <laughs> the simplest uh, answer or what have you? Sure. Um, th that, that may be it. Um, the reason it's called the um, Zagreb mummy is because it was a, I think it was a Croatian archaeologist um, or an aristocrat in the um, 1800s, I believe, was down or 1900s was down in Egypt. And basically it was a time when, you know, mummies were like the thing. You would just grab your mummy. Um, so this um, Croatian, it took the mummy back to uh, Zagreb. And it is now in the um, it, the mummy, along with the linens, with Etruscan writing, is now in a Zagreb museum. Um, I mean, one would think that this all had to happen in Egypt, or else the linen would not be preserved. Right. Over thousands of years, right? Because yep. it's it's bi very biodegradable. Mm -hmm. But uh, Egyptians, uh, first they had the dry climate, and they they were using drying drying chemicals mm -hmm. in order to create the mummy so uh yeah the, these things are preserved just like papyrus is preserved in egypt and basically no other place yeah, yeah a, a comment here um linen was the fiber and fabric for egypt um they used very little wool or cotton almost all of the, the white cloth that was one sees in the egyptian funerary uh, pictures. That's I think that's assumed to be all linen from the flax plant, which is, which grows in Egypt. Now in Greece and Mesopotamia, wool was the primary uh, fiber and fabric, and I suppose that would be true of Italy as well, where Italy was most cloth and fabric wool. Yeah, wool so was that very would yeah. Yeah. So that would suggest that this linen may have, the linen may have originated in in Egypt. Yeah. And was consumed in Egypt apparently. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and just real quick, um, Ralph, you mentioned, you know, wool in Italy, and actually wool is something that um, a, a lot of the, the women are responsible for, for spinning and producing fabrics from. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so our last um, period is the Hellenization and Roman period that's going to take place for a couple of centuries between the third and first centuries uh, BCE. What we have happening here is that um, Rome is, is ambitious and wants more and more control of Etruria and is kind of chipping away at Etrurian city-states. Um, the Etruscans are not responding as a federation, as a union. The cities are basically operating uh, to some extent independently. So it's pretty easy for Rome to come in as a more of a greater power and pick them off one by one. Some are suing for peace, um, some are fighting back, um, and some are left alone like um, Cerveteri because they're actually allies of Rome to begin with. For those that are allied with Rome, um, there is actually fighting, um, um, infighting amongst the Etruscans um, that's happening and it is furthering to weaken um, their kind of like control. Eventually a league of Etruscans, Umbrians and Gauls will kind of unite and they are intending to fend off Rome um, it's not as successful as we see the Roman Empire emerge, but the third and second centuries um, is a time when Rome does significant defeating of Etruscan cities. And with that comes a colonization, um, Romans moving into Etruscan cities and kind of establishing or merging uh, more and more culturally. And then we have like a, an example of kind of what what the experience was like um, on the ground, if you will, and it's from the siege of Troilum and the Romanization of aristocracy. So Rome comes into this location, Troy, Troilum, this city state, um, and the aristocrats they have money. The Romans come and say, you know, if you pay us, we'll leave you alone, you know, or you can sue for peace, but we're still going to move in. And the aristocrats basically bribe their way to safety um, and they leave the poor people and the middle class people to kind of um, fend for themselves. They abandon them um, and they're just kind of left to defend or leave their, their city. And this is something that seems to be a thing that was happening as the aristocratic class of um, Etruria um, is becoming more and more Romanized, and that is more, ex more along their line of acceptable. While the lower classes and middle class and all, they're suffering more at the hands of, you know, fighting, fighting back or not having any other place to go. So the mm -hmm. middle and lower classes are suffering a great deal from the Roman incursions into their territory. This is a, uh, one quick question. One of the reasons that they also were conquering Etruscans because they allied themselves with Carthage, right? They, they also didn't like Yes. It. Yes. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And then the, the kind of like the, the end times um, is that there is integration with Rome. Now, the Etruscans don't just, quote, disappear, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the end. Um, but there is, you know, integration or absorption um, with, with Rome then during the end here. And what you're seeing here is a reconstruction of a tomb that was er erected in the second and first centuries BCE. Um, this is from the area of Volterra. And, all, and you see all of these really elaborate sarcophagi, right, with these figures that are adorning them of the dead, um, it's basically buried into um, volcanic tufa and all, and these are all of the, the individuals, which I just find absolutely fascinating, you know, how they were able to, to do that, that kind of carving. And so this is pretty reminiscent of um, the, the Greek Hellenizing period um, of art that takes place um, along the same timeline. I'm gonna um, kind of move this a little quickly because I wanna make sure that I respect your time. Um, talking now about the political makeup. Um, and this is a really interesting part for me because it seems to be the most, uh, one of the most nebulous areas. 
There is the understanding that there was a league of 12 and in later times, 15 um, city states and they form something loosely I'll call an alliance. Um, they were independent city states that were operating throughout Etruria, throughout their history. This league um, met once a year at this location called Phanum Valumne, and they elected a top ruler. But there's a couple of things that we don't know. One is we don't know where this location is, and we don't know they elected a ruler, but what did this ruler do? It, we don't know why that was an important um, ritual that happened annually. It appears that this, the I think the scholarship is suspecting that this annual meeting may have been like a religious celebration or festival with games, um, but there, it's there's not a lot of evidence supporting that or not supporting it. Um, they were not unified under one king or ruler. That was that was uh, clear. And then. <laughs> On this image right here, this is a coin that dates from 200 BCE, and it shows the Gorgon. Um, and what this is, um, um, I guess, reflective of in terms of kingship is that the kings, the, these kings of these city-states, these rulers of the city-states, um, there is a suspicion that they held power over life and death um, of their, quote, consist constituents, to use some kind of a term. Um, so that is what this coin may be representing is that power that is held by those kings. And Romans and Etruscans, I found this interesting. It, this was from one of my sources. They didn't consider each other, quote, like foreigners. You know how like the Greeks would look to some people and call them barbarians because they bar, 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 that's how they spoke and they, they were uncultured and all. The Romans and Etruscans, they had a kind of like a, a meshed relationship um, and they didn't look at each other as, as foreigners, um, at least in, you know, their earlier, um, integrations or earlier um, um, happenings or getting together with each other. The um, Etruscan kings of Rome, because we have to talk about those guys, um, and I make a little note here that I see someone is presenting, I believe, on the, Etrus uh, on the seven kings of Rome. So I'm going to do this briefly because I don't want to cut into anybody's time here. But what I learned was that there were seven kings of Rome. The last three likely are ones that were real and they had Etruscan names. The first was Tarquinius Priscus, um, who ruled for quite a long time, I guess almost 30 years there, 35 years, and um, is responsible we believe, but Paul sent me an article that makes me question this a little bit now, that he was responsible for this thing, the Cloaca Maxima, which was a drainage system, a very elaborate drainage system that was underneath the, what would later become the Roman Forum uh, and all. And the area of the Roman Forum was an area that was prone to flooding. Um, and the Etruscans, as well as others in the region, um, had devised mechanisms for actually expelling water and redirecting water into rivers. So the reason I say that there's a little mark there that it's a two is that um, Paul's article that he forwarded, maybe Paul, you want to talk about it, <coughs> excuse me while I cough, um, is um, that it may or may not have been an Etruscan undertaking or a Latin taking. Yeah, I, I think me for uh, one minute here. The time, you know, the, the time to really go into it is when we're talking about Rome. So I don't want to distract too much from uh, from Etruria. Uh, but uh, the the argument of, of this writer, uh, Tim Cornell, is that um, the the um, chronology is all wrong. Uh, there, there, there had to be many more than seven kings. Uh, the the um, and that there was no Etruscan conquest or Etruscan domination of Rome. What there was was a cosmopolitan environment in Rome where there were people who came in from many different places, 
and that in fact the kings of Rome were all outsiders. Uh, there were two with only two with uh, uh, Etrurian names, and then uh, um, uh, uh, Num King Numa Pompilius was a Sabine, um, and uh, that, that so that the it seems like what the Roman kingship was really about was an outsider who came in and they were never a member of the Roman aristocracy. They were in opposition to the Roman aristocracy. And when they were finally thrown out of Rome, it was by the Roman aristocracy and not by the people. And the, the Roman, the aristocracy basically forced the people to swear that they would never again uh, worship, you know, uh, go, um, basically follow a king that uh, tried to inhibit the rights of the aristocracy. And then from then on Rome, the, if, if some uh, politician in Rome championed the underclasses, the aristocracy would immediately start screaming, he wants to make himself king. And uh, ultimately the, the, we can say the, you know, the culmination of that was probably Julius Caesar. So I'll leave the rest for talking about Rome. Thank, thank you, Paul. Yep. Um, so this is, I, I mean, I love this image because I just find it so beautiful and I've never seen it um, yeah, myself. So um, I was fascinated uh, by that. The next king of Rome was um, Servius Tullius. And what he is credited with um, creating or implementing was some kind of a census system. And it was a means to really track, you know, the taxation that was um, happening, as well as military service that would that people were participating in and giving the, of themselves and their money. Um, and there was a reference to assignment of some kind of class system. And I think they had five classes at this time. He will be assassinated by, I believe, his um, daughter and um, future son-in-law. And that future son-in-law is going to be Tarquinius Superbus, who um, will be the last of the kings here of Rome. Um, and he'll be ousted in 509 BCE. Now, what I learned was that if you know someone has a name that's Tarquin or Tarquinius, that usually is a sign that they are Etruscan in, in origin or uh, related to Etruscans. Now, in terms of the end of these kings, and I mentioned them because of the, the Tarquins being the last of them and the foundation of the Republic, our main sources for the legend of what happened and why this happens are Livy, Dio, and Dionysus. Superbus, Tarquinus, Superbus is the last. And there is the rape of Lucretia um, that takes place in or around 509 BCE. And for those who are unfamiliar with the story, Lucretia is um, an outstanding and virtuous noblewoman and wife. We see her here beautifully painted by Titian. And this is her husband uh, pleading with her. And he's pleading with her because what she's about to do is plunge a knife into her breast um, and commit suicide. And the reason for that is because um, she has been shamed. She has been raped by um, Sextus Tarquin, who is the son of the, the last Etruscan king, Tarquin Superbus. And he threatens to kill her unless she submits um, and say that she was an adulteress. So she shares the same shame with her family, lets them know what it is that she happens, and then she commits suicide. And this is the supposed to be the impetus for the overthrow of the kings. Now, real quick uh, segue here into religious beliefs. Um, and what we, when we talk about the Etruscan religious beliefs, it's really interesting because the archeologists and scholars are really piecing things together based on these artifacts and these really brief texts that we have, like that ritual calendar that was found in the linens of a Ptolemaic era, era mummy. Uh, what has been learned is that there's the, um, the earth and the heavens and, the, and uh, deep in the earth are populated by spiritual forces. Some are monstrous and demonic, these forces, and some are like guardians of the dead. There is uh, worship and rituals that are related to the hero. And we see 
like this beautiful bronze object um, that's a crested helmet that actually dates from the 9th century BCE. Uh, and it's really quite beautiful. And it was found as part of a funerary burial. The worship, it is thought, of these kind of um, spiritual beings is the reserve of the nobles. So it's not something that is, I guess, entrusted to everyone. Um, it is something that is at in a more aristocratic class that's taking place, at least on behalf of a city and all. Uh, and worship is something that took place in open air shrines. So there weren't like closed in temples or altars. Um, and it, it kind of like, Looking at this, it reminds me somewhat of the belief system that Akhenaten uh, and his followers were uh, believing in it during his time during the Amarna period. And that is, you know, there's this solar deity, this, at, this Aten, and it infuses everything with a life force. While there are many different spiritual beings, still everything kind of ha is infused with its own life force. So I sound, found that um, a little bit interesting, a little interesting parallel here. Some more about the early beliefs um, is that um, anthropomorphic representation, at least early on like this, was not practiced. What they, what they tended to worship were like objects, stone, uh, like stone or wood or weapons, but not something that had a human face to it. And a number of tombs have been found like small nude female statuettes. And it, it appears that these have been inspired by contacts with the Near East, um, possibly ties to Ishtar and Astarte, uh, they may be representing uh, birth and fertility and rebirth. This here is from the sixth century BCE and it um, is thought it might be the bust, just as when they're starting to use um, human forms to represent deities. This actually might be one of the earlier representations of a goddess um, it, as, a, as a human. And she's holding this beautiful little bird that actually has gold foil around it. When we get to later beliefs, there is the acculturation and kind of the merging with the Greek um, pantheon. There is a shift from the domain of nobility to all to in order uh, to be able to practice the worship of these gods. Uh, it wasn't a simple religious syncretism. Uh, there are native variations and it was constantly evolving. So it wasn't, I saw some references where it was, you know, this god is that god in Rome, that god in Greek, and this god in Etruria. And that's not really how it works, although I still have an example of that um, right here. But they're kind of like their main deities were like a head deity referred to as Tin or Tinium, um, his consort um, Uni. Um, Menfra was their uh, kind of Athena, and then Fulfans, who's very important in their culture, um, was the equivalent of like a Bacchus or a Dionysus. But one of the things that um, I thought was a good example was the worship of this Etruscan Menfra. And while she's worshipped as, um, while Athena is worshipped as like a military military figure, the Etruscan Menvra is really worshipped as a protector of women and children and childbirth. So different um, interpretation of it, but there's still some parallels, um, but they've definitely made it their own. And this is a statue, thought, a little statuette thought to be um, the kind of the head of the deities, Tin or Tinia. Um, this is definitely something that's really interesting. It's called the Etruscia, Etrus, Etruscia Disciplina. And it's um, brought to us by the myth of Tages. And it is unique to Etruscan beliefs. There's no other representation of it. Um, it is formed around the discipline of reading livers of sacrificed animals. And here we have this wonderful bronze image um, it's supposed to represent the sheep liver um, that of a sacrificial um, victim. 
And it is it really interesting because you can see on here engraved like these divisions with this writing on it. And this, there are 16 regions that are represented on this liver model. And they're supposed to represent the 16 divisions of heaven and the associated deity that rules over it. So the Disciplina Etrusca is composed of three parts. There's a cosmology part to it. So the reading of like the history of their world. There's also the, um, the aspect of divining the future. So some kind of prophecy. And then lastly, there's the ritual act of finding ways to perform an intervention um, to basically appease the gods and prevent their wrath. You know, and then we have the myth of Tages or Tajis. Um, and the myth of Tajis is really um, a very interesting one. And so you remember how I told you to remember about the, the young boy that may have been epileptic and the, um, the infants that were found buried with him next to a cavity in the earth? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. So the myth is that a farmer is out plowing his field and he comes across this young boy, Tagis, who emerges from his tilled soil. <clears throat> and he has the wisdom and kind of the face of um, a wise old man. And he basically communicates to the farmer. He hands him kind of like a, a, like a you know, Moses or something, the Disciplina Etrusca. And he says, this is the set of rules that govern our relationship, the relationship between the divine and humans. So there is thinking that this um, burial back in, I think it was the eighth century BCE, they've dated it too, um, that maybe this possibly epileptic boy was thought to be this Tages um, individual um, and that he had to be buried near a cavity in the earth because that's where he emerged from um, originally. So I thought that was a pretty interesting kind of um, deduction or fantasy maybe. Um, so that was a bit about their spiritual beliefs. Um, and I'm gonna move us on to what's happening in terms of their death because death for them is extremely important as we see in these wonderful tombs we're gonna take a tour through. Uh, and it also is how we find out the most information about the Etruscan culture. So what you're looking at here is an aerial view of a very elaborate necropolis um, at the location Ceveteri and all. Uh, they had elaborate necropolises. Um, there were up to 6,000 people uh, that were buried in these areas. They were extremely well planned. Um, and so the archeologists believe that this is a representation of how their, their cities um, were laid out, how their roads were built. Um, and even these, um, these locations, these, these burial sites have neighborhoods where there are clusters of, of related people and they have like certain elements, maybe a fountain or something that they're clustered around. So there's a real kind of like flavor of the neighborhood there. There are a wide range of tombs that are um, present in these necropoli. We have these tumuli, um, which are the really big kind of aristocratic burial chambers that take many people to build. Then there are trench burials where the, the more common people, maybe um, servants, maybe slaves are buried. And then there's also these rock cut tombs that are more middle class. And I think one of the kind of like a um, like apexes of the, um, the the burials is this concept of a hypogeum, which is a complete mirror reflection of maybe what that aristocrat's home looks like in real life. Um, it really helps us to understand the domestic architecture, how their homes could have been built. And two of these burial, these necropoli, are actually considered UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And also, I'll definitely be going to visit them. 
Here um, we see kind of like um, an artist rendition uh, based on the condition of a particular tomb, um, Tomb of the Painted Animals. Um, this is at Cheveterian and dates from 600 uh, BCE. Uh, and the thing that I wanted to point out here is that there are very elaborate columns that you see set up here. You have what is likely either a bench um, for a banquet or possibly a sarcophagi sarcophagus. I'm not sure which it is, but there's definitely benches that are here. Um, what I love about this drawing, though, is it makes me think of the Pantheon, Hadrian's Pantheon in Rome, because you have something that looks kind of like an oculus, although it's not open. And then you have these lovely coffers in the ceiling. So a very advanced architectural design elements for a tomb, um, which I find really, really wonderful. And then here is an external view of what tumuli burials at Cheveteri look like. And also they kind of look, uh, I mean, they look interesting. They look like huts, you know, but a, a lot of these tombs, um, you uh, descend very deep inside them and you'll come across something like this. Here's a pretty well-known example of one of the elaborate tombs. It's called Tomb of the Reliefs. Um, it is a rock cut hypogeum is the official kind of name for it. And what makes it, um, what made it uh, people able to have such elaborate detail that's carved into here, because these are basically kind of like high reliefs. That is not like, these are not real ornamentations that are hanging here. These are actual reliefs that have been carved out of the, 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 material. And the reason that they were able to do that and why you find tombs that are elaborately carved like this is because in these, in certain locations, it's volcanic tufa, which is very malleable and soft to carve. Um, and once it is carved and exposed to the air, it becomes very durable and hard. So it allowed for this certain kind of architecture. This particular tomb dates to the late fourth, um, early third century BCE. Um, once the objects, the architecture is actually carved and you see that there are um, like not, they're not coffins, but they're actually like little sleeping quarters or maybe benches where there are pillows. They may be representative <clears throat> of uh, basically the banquet, which is extremely important in Etruscan culture, just as it was um, the symposia in the Greek world, and it will become important in the Roman world as well. Um, once the tufa is carved, it's then plastered over and painted. So what you're seeing, I believe, is still real paint. Um, and this is meant to mimic a banquet scene with the reclining couches. Um, and it's owned by an aristocratic family, and it mirrors basically their life. Another aspect of death that's really important um, are the wall reliefs, the tomb wall reliefs, and the technique is fresco. The most common scenes are ones of like the good life, you know, drinking and parties and banquets and, you know, entertainment. They're really embracing what it means to have the good life. Um, there is also a representation of animals and the natural environment that's really important to them. As you can see from this beautiful wall painting from the tomb of hunting and fishing. And this one is a little bit different. Um, it's actually quite a bit different than a lot of the wall reliefs that we find or wall paintings that we find throughout the tombs in Etruria. And the reason is that you have this wonderful scene of this diver Right? You have this young boy that's diving into the, the water. Um, and then there's this other figure up here that appears to be another boy who's kind of going, preparing to be the next one to dive in. So there's different theories as to, you know, is this just really a scene of the good life, meaning, you know, they lived along the coast, they love to go diving, um, or is it a scene that's representative of the, the transition of life to death? And, and I think more people lean towards it's just what you see is what you get. It's a beautiful scene of diving. Um, and you also have some boaters down here along with these beautiful birds here. 
Um, something else that's represented on wall paintings, not reliefs, is um, are demons and guardians. And so demons and darker imagery is going to start to emerge, darker meaning and more ominous, is going to start to emerge when um, the Etrurian, Etruscans are starting to lose um, kind of their footing and Rome is becoming more and more powerful. That's when we see these kind of things emerge. Here's another example. Um, this is from the Tomb of the Lepers that dates to 480 to 470 BCE. That's from another necropolis at Tarquinia, which has a number of these really lovely, lovely tombs. What you see here is very, very typical of what's presented in most of the wall paintings. Um, here is a banquet scene. Uh, you've got people, couples. So that's important to note. There are couples, it's not just men that are enjoying these, these banquets that are listening to music. When we look over here, we've got someone that's playing the double flute or Iolus, I think it's what it's called. Um, you've got the nature scenes that are happening over here. Uh, the women, the men, they're being served by naked servants or slaves. And then up here is where you get the name. It's the tomb of the tomb of the leopards here. You've got a couple of leopards up at the top. I know. Something else that I found was really interesting is that they believe that this representation, this very elaborate ceiling decoration with these, these squares and circles, may actually be representative of funerary tents that would be erected next to the tombs um, for banquets that were to be enjoyed um, to kind of celebrate the life of the person who has passed away. Now let's take a look at some of the other um, parts of death and we're going to take a look at urns and sarcophagi. Um, so first this is one of the um, earliest types of funerary um, urns that are found um, and this is dating from the Villanovan culture. So it's the 9th, 9th to 8th century uh, BCE. Um, and why um, archeologists really love this is they believe that this is kind of representative of what a, a hut, a home really looks like during this time period and all. There is evidence that they lived in these circular huts and that there was at the top of their, on their roof line, these kind of carved wooden um, roof um, beams or, or pieces of wood. And it was more, I think, decorative than it was actually uh, utilitarian, um, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But already from this time period, and there'd be ashes that were um, inside this urn, you know, you see this really elaborate detail um, and bronze working that's that's taking place here, which I just found I find absolutely exquisite um, for the for the time period. So it helps us to understand the uh, their domestic architecture. Then you also have very famous pieces like this, this full scale life size uh, sarcophagus. It's called the sarcophagus of the spouses. Um, again, it kind of speaks to the fact that women had equal status with men, as we see this woman is on the same hierarchic scale as the man. Um, she is in front of the man. She's wearing this very elaborate headdress as well as um, clothing. She's wearing little shoes here. Um, her husband is naked from the waist up. Um, they're very well quaffed. They're reclining on their banquet couch, enjoying a drink together. Um, one, uh, somebody uh, that I was listening to, one of my professors was saying that this is actually, they're holding eggs. And I'm not quite sure um, if that is confirmed or not. Um, and it's just, it's really interesting. I find it very touching that we have this kind of representation this particular um, sarcophagus is um, for one individual, but oftentimes there were a couple sarcophagus like this where there'd be one chamber for the wife and one chamber for the husband. And what you see here is not a mistake. This is not because of bad archeologists or anything, this line, but actually because these objects were so big, they didn't have kilns that were big enough to fire them whole. So they had them 
they would do it in pieces is how they would fire them. Now we're taking a look at another wonderful piece, and this is from the lid of a sarcophagus, and it is inscribed um, for both the, the wife and the husband. Again, they're at the same level. Um, they're um, engaged in a very intimate embrace, which you don't see very often um, in um, ancient kind of um, artistic representation to, to this degree. Like this is like a, a like you're looking at a marriage bed. That's what they suspect it is. Uh, and they're not wearing any clothes. They're underneath this beautiful drapery and we can see their, their body forms underneath the, the drapery. And it's in more of a Greek classical style. And that actually is in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So visit. Here are some other things that are emerging from Etruscan graves. And a lot of these graves, the aristocratic ones, um, were found with um, the ones that were intact with these amazing grave goods. And here's just a couple of examples of grave goods that were found from an aristocratic woman's tomb. And this is from uh, the 675 to 650 BCE. Uh, it is from Cerveteri from the Regolini Galassi tomb. This is an aristocratic woman. So what you see here is this beautiful pectoral, which the body, it was draped over the body because she was, she was buried. She was not cremated, she was buried. And with this absolutely incredible detail that is carved on it. You also have another wonderful bronze leves with these protomes, these uh, bronze griffin head or lion head attachments. And then also found was um, the, a wooden chariot. So obviously this is a reconstruction because there was very little of it that was really left, but it was covered with some beautiful metallic and I think some stone inlay and they've tried to recreate it here. And I'll, so I just, I found it really, uh, really interesting. And this type of cart was typical for the Etruscan aristocratic women to be um, hold, hold through their, their roads um, on this. Now there are parallels with Egyptian beliefs. So this is kind of interesting when we take into consideration that mummy linen wrapping. And unlike other Mediterranean cultures um, around this time, the Etruscans really are obsessed with death. Their tombs are extremely elaborate. They invest a lot of time and resources in tomb building like Egyptians of certain dynasties. You know, um, they believed in an afterlife that was really important to them. There is new scholarship from two professors and I did some digging um, after hearing them speak and found that this is something that's been floating around for a while. But these two professors that they're at UC Berkeley, one's an Egyptologist, the other is a specialist in first century um, BCE Italy, um, is that there are parallels in terms of how they viewed kind of the journey um, of death. You know, it wasn't like your life didn't just end and then, then you were dead. You actually went through a series of challenges um, uh, you were confronted by monsters and demons that wanted you, didn't want you to enter um, to the next level. Um, and it, I just find it extremely interesting that there are all, all of these parallels. And what you're seeing here is one of these um, guardians. And this is, the guardian is named Charu, um, which is, I guess, the equivalent of the um, Sharon uh, ferryman that sh that ferries the um, deceased across the river Styx. Um, he is kind of representative of a similar role. And what he is holding in his hands are these bearded snakes. And we also find bearded snakes in Egypt. And what he's doing here is he's fending off this very evil looking monster, this demon that's coming to basically attack or to divert the journey of the dead as they are progressing down to the underworld and going through their different stages. I just found that super interesting. There's that happening um, there. So Egypt has bearded snakes like uh, we find in uh, Etruria, demons and, and guardians as well. And then there are the challenges. 
Now this is, we start to see the emergence of this kind of belief system or the representation in the tombs on the walls, wall, really, uh, wall paintings, um, during the time when Etruscans are losing power and Rome is gaining power. So there's a time of crisis, so there's more um, kind of not negative imagery, but more of this fearful imagery that's emerging. Here's another view of underworld demons and guardians. I have to be honest with you, when I saw this, I thought this would look like a cartoon. This looks straight out of a, you know, an old fashioned newspaper to me, the way that these figures are depicted. I don't know if they've been retouched, to be honest with you, I really don't know, but it kind of appears to be they may have been. Um, but on the left, we have that character Sharun, again, the ferryman of the dead, the protector of the, get, uh, the dead. And then we also have Vanth, who is a female demon, but she's a demon and a guardian. And she brings light to the darkness. So you kind of, you want both of these people, these um, figures, guardians in your court when you're traveling the underworld, because they will help you to fend off the demons. Um, let me see, is there anything else on here that I need to mention here? There's something else, and this is not an example of it. But we see the uh, appearance more and more of something called the Porta Libertinas, and it was the port of death. So there would be a physical, uh, I mean, a, a painted red door on some of these tombs, and uh, around it were surrounded like people that were enjoying banquets and all, and that red door was there alone for the deceased person to journey through and start their journey to the underworld. Right, so that's about their spiritual beliefs and then their death beliefs. Now let's take a look at some of the wonderful art and architecture that emerges from this culture. So I mentioned earlier that pottery was really important to the Etruscans and they imported a lot of, um, of pottery that especially came from Athens, also from Corinth, but a lot from Athens. Um, and their demand was such that the Athenian potters and painters actually produced Etruscan style ware to satisfy the market, to satisfy the demand. They even adopted a certain uh, style that was native to the Etruscans, and that's called bukero. Large quantities of these attic pottery vessels are found in tombs in Cerveteri. And then we see the decline, especially in the Tyrrhenian seacoast, when the Etruscan navy is defeated by Syracuse in, five, in 474 BCE. So here's an example of things that have been found um, from Athens in, in um, Etruscan tombs. And this is the same, the same object, it's beautiful. It's depicting basically a um, sea battle. And it's not known if this is supposed to represent one of these is supposed to represent an Etruscan um, sailing vessel. Um, we're not 100% sure, but this was in, um, you know, it was pieced back together. It was broken, but still it's largely intact and it's just um, very beautiful. This is uh, one of the most famous pieces that is from, um, from Greece and it's called the Francois Base. And it's one of the largest symposium vessels that has ever been found. It was discovered in a Chusi tomb, and it depicts the story of Achilles and Theseus on it. There are some 270 figures, and what I didn't add here is that there are some 140 names that are also included inscribed on this in Greek, I believe. And we also have the name of the painter and the potter that are inscribed on this. I mentioned uh, this style of pottery that's native to Etruria, and this is a very beautiful example of it. It's called bucero, and the technique is that they um, would take purified clay, so they'd remove all of the impurities, and they would fire it in a kiln that had very little oxygen in it. And what that resulted in was this very, very dark color, and it kind of had this burnished look to it. So you see this reflection in it. It can be very reflective. And it was prized because the, the vase could be made to be extremely thin, the walls of it. 
Um, and it's really kind of like their hallmark between the seventh and fourth centuries here. And I just really love this, this image here. And the content, uh, what they tended to include as artwork on the actual vessel was a lot having to do with nature and vegetation and vines and swirls. Um, there is a certain um, kind of scene that's called Buquero Pesante, and it's when there are decorations with animals or narrative scenes. And then we also see that they have adapted some um, Egyptian and Near Eastern vessels that are made out of precious metals. So if we just zoom in here, we can see influence from the Near East. Uh, we have like a panther, it looks like here. We have what looks like maybe a gazelle that may be under attack, but looks pretty peaceful to me. But then you have these just like this really beautiful burnished look and that's actually um, terracotta that's been fired. Here are other examples of pottery that's emerging from the Etruscan culture. They were largely um, influenced by the Greeks and actually had Greeks that were setting up workshops close to, close to them and in parallel with them. They would work together in workshops. They'd work under Greeks. So there is a lot of cross uh, pollination that's happening in the pottery world. But here's an, it, one that's dated to 630 to 600 BCE. And it really has like an oriental period type treatments. There are rosettes, there are animals that are paraded um, and they're divided into two registers. And other examples a bit later, it's dating to 520 to 510 BCE. This is attributed to the Etruscan eagle painter um, and it is showing Heracles and Iolus um, slaying the Hydra together here. And you see, this is a typical Etruscan kind of decoration with these kind of like hearts or um, leaves that are in the shape of hearts that is decorating here, very elaborately decorated. And then the last one here is the, unfortunately I have this this little watermark here is called the Volute Crater and it's red figure and it dates from the fourth century BCE. And it shows the Greek myth about Peleus wrestling with Thetis. So on these, both of these vessels here to the right, what you can take away is that there is a lot of Greek mythology that is working its way into Etruscan culture and is reflected in the Etruscan culture. Greek mythology is extremely important to them, like their, the Greek, Greek pantheon. So very important. In terms of bronze, what we have happening here is that, you know, I've already shown you a little bit, but they are master bronze workers. Their works are sought outside of Greece as well as within Etruria. Um, a lot of it is used for votive offerings and decoration for, furnishing, for furnishings, funerary in nature. Um, it was a resource to which they had direct access with all of those mines um, and they could basically smelt their own bronze. And they used a technique called toretics, which is basically embossed metalwork. Here's a wonderful example. It's called the Ficurini Sista. And what it is depicting here is um, these, this is um, full Fulfoons, which is their Bacchus or, or Dionysus. And he's surrounded by his um, satyrs on either side. And then we have a, basically a scene from uh, when the Argonauts go in search of the Golden Fleece. And they stop at an uh, island that's ruled by, I believe, King Aliotos and all who basically refuses them water unless um, he is beat in a boxing match. And so the semi-divine hero Pollux comes to the rescue. He defeats the king. And what we're seeing here is basically his punishment. He's been tied to a tree by the, um, the Argonauts as they prepare to uh, leave um, and continue on their journey after drinking water. That they finally got. And this dates to 350 to 300 BCE. Uh, and it is actually a container that was given to a young woman. Um, it is believed on the day or for her, her marriage. It was given by her mother. And it basically is a vessel in which she was 
store her toilettes, you know, her items like her combs or her mirror, um, her items that relate to personal appearance and keeping it up. This um, wonderful Camara of Arezzo is um, almost a, you know, it's larger than a large dog. It's a very large bronze sculpture, and it is one of the very few large-scale bronzes that date to this period that was found, you know, ver completely intact, and it's a really wonderful piece. So it is the chi chimera um, that has a lion's head, a goat's head, and then spines and a snake's tail. It's a votive um, object, and there's a dedication along the leg. Uh, it was uh, likely part of a larger sculptural group, which included Bel Bellerophon and his winged horse Pegasus, who slay together this uh, chimera. And in this scene, the chimera has actually been wounded, and there is a blood that can be seen on the other side of the statue has been wounded and is dying. And this is something that was um, fashioned around 400 CE. Bronze. Other objects that come from um, grave goods um, shows this wonderful uh, jewelry and metal work that's done in gold and stones. And the reason that I wanted to show this to you is because they are using a technique. The Etruscans become extremely gifted in a certain technique, which I'm not sure you're going to be able to see very well, that's called granulation. And this whole text that you're seeing here is comprised not of like say a string of gold that's then attached um, onto a solid gold um, back, backing. This is actually made up of little tiny like one millimeter size balls, like the size of really tiny ball bearings and all. And they became masters at doing this and I, recommend if you're you're fascinated by this to look up like a YouTube video on how do you do gold granulation and it's fascinating. So um, extremely difficult to accomplish and they are using, you know, not like technologically advanced tools, but they were able to get to this level of detail. And someone I heard that was being interviewed about it had questions around, well, you know, who was doing the work because their eyesight must have just you know, gone away so soon after working on this stuff. Um, it's really quite uh, amazing what they were able to do. Then here's some more jewelry that was found in an aristocratic tomb. All of this was found in the same tomb. You can see extreme um, access, ex access to extreme wealth. Some of these are semi-precious stones. It's gold. Um, other is gold, uh, is glass paste. And it's a quick question. Yes. Uh, Mario on the chat says, is the inscription text in Greek or Etruscan? It's in Etruscan, I believe. Okay. Yeah, I believe it is in Etruscan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another aspect of art for them is that they become masters of working in large scale terracotta. So this is a larger than life size figure. It is the Apollo of they. It is thought to, it was found um, in a temple or near a temple um, dedicated to Menvra. They're kind of like Athena, if you will. And what makes it so amazing, um, this large scale, is that it's a very difficult medium to work in. It's extremely um, fragile. Uh, it required firing in sections. I mentioned that on the sarcophagus image because they didn't have kilns that were large enough and also just to try and maneuver and manage working with uh, such a huge object, um, very uh, difficult to do. The interior is hollow and they were like Greek statues, um, always painted. We believe they were always painted. Now this particular uh, guy, which I think is really interesting, was he was one of many objects that were deities that were actually attached to the roof line of an Etruscan temple to Menra and all. So he's not even down at the base. He's not on ground level. He's actually up on the roof line. So imagine, you know, taking a look at this temple and you see all of these gods looking down on you as you enter into the temple. Um, very different experience than something we will see with like Greek uh, temples. 
And why are they using terracotta? I mean, come on, you've got like the marble of Carrera, right? Um, they didn't have access to it. Uh, it wasn't something that was ex, uh, was um, tapped into quite yet. And they also didn't have a reliable source of like any kind of stone that would be able to be carved to this extent. The content, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's heavy archaic influence, as you can see here. Let me take a closer look here. So you can see he's got this kind of awkward archaic smile. He is also somewhat in the position of a Ah, thank you. But he's in the position um, of, you know, this upright, he's kind of stiff, he's less stiff than an arch archaic Kourous or Kore and all, but he's got some of the similar features um, that we find in Greece. A lot of these large life uh, figures are deities, and then there, it's also terracotta, large scale terracotta is used for sarcophagi. Um, wall paintings, um, very elaborate wall paintings are happening um, and they are real masters of this. And I love these depictions because we see some three-dimensionality, we see movement, we see expression that's happening, we see the integration with the natural world. <clears throat> we have enough detail to be able to identify some of these birds, some of these plants. Um, as well as this wonderful representation of a, a lyre or, or a little harpsichord and all. But they're really wonderful what they're able to achieve. Um, and this is in 470 BCE and all. This again shows, you know, a woman that's obviously, you know, enjoying herself. She's um, at a, a banquet, she's dancing. Um, and this was something that was really um, captivating to the tomb um, owners, you know, the dead, but also for people that had come in to, to celebrate the life of the deceased. Now, moving on to religious architecture, um, and I'm just going to quickly go through this because we are running out of time here. But these are some of the things that have been attributed to, quote, like uh, um, an Etruscan style of religious architecture. Remember how I mentioned just a moment ago that you had these life-size deity figures that were atop the roof line? This is what it looks like. So very heavy objects that are placed atop a roof. And the roof is made of timber. The walls are mud brick, and this is largely the reason that we have small footprints that remain, but not the actual architectural ruins um, like we have of, say, Greek or Egyptian stone or marble, marble um, temples. It was a square layout, so it wasn't rectangular like we see in Greece. And um, there was uh, almost equal space out on their porch, the front porch, um, and the actual interior of the temple. Uh, it's built, they were built atop platforms. There was one entrance um, only, uh, and they have a technique, um, oops, that's called an engaged uh, column, which is really, it's just a decorative element. So it's not freestanding like this. It would be along the sides here of the um, walls of the temple. And they were actually just kind of like a fixed um, columns that had been split in half. So it was really just for decoration. How there much is this temple uh, is standing somewhere. Um, so that's a good question. I don't think there's hardly any of the temple that's left standing. Everything has basically left to ruin. In fact, when I was going through some of the, the works, I didn't see any, quote, temples that were standing. This is a recreation of the temple based on the layout and what we know about their, um, their architecture, which comes a lot from Greek and Roman writers. Here is um, a little bit on the Tuscan order um, because there is an official order that's been designated um, that was in use 
during Roman times and Etruscan times. Um, and it is like, if you think of the Doric order, the Ionic, Ionic and Corinthian orders, this is one additional order. Um, <clears throat> these columns would be made out of mud um, and a wood, a mud brick. Um, and our understanding of architecture to kind of like piggyback on what Greg just asked is from you know, the layout of their tombs, um, the grave goods, some of them have like little uh, temples, which I forgot to, to mention, but there are actual urns that are in the shape of what is thought to be religious architecture, like a temple. And then we also have a couple of ancient writers like Vitruvius um, wrote De, De Architectura in 30 BCE. And then we also have another work from much later, um, CE 1563. Um, and this is where this image comes from, which shows very plain columns. There's no kind of like acanthian leaves up here like there are in the, um, in the uh, Corinthian order, for instance. Very, very plain, very simple. And now we're at the end of the thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually leave you with questions because in doing this, I still have a lot of questions. Um, and one of the questions that it seems to always come up is, were the Etruscans the founders of Rome? And a Paul's article ties in nicely to this. Um, but it really depends on who you ask, right? You could ask a Roman scholar and the answer is no. You ask an Etruscan scholar and the answer is yes. Um, I think at the end of the day, we know that the Etruscans had influence um, in Rome as the Romans had influence in Etruria. Uh, I believe that there was a great deal of cross-pollination, not just between Romans and Latins uh, and Etruscans, but also with Greece and with the Near East and with Egypt. So there's a lot of cross-pollination that's happening and it's expressing itself differently um, in what we call Italy. The next question is, what happened to the Etruscans? Uh, they did ultimately merge with the Roman Empire. Uh, there, I did mention that there was more of that um, um, merging that happened at the aristocratic level. Um, they used their wealth as a means to secure positions and kind of continue the lifestyle that they had had um, as Etruscans. And like our understanding of the Greco-Persian Wars, we have Greek uh, materials, but we don't have the Persian side of things. And that's the case with the Etruscans. We don't have them writing their history and telling us what happened to them or what their culture was all about. So we're having to do a lot of inferring um, from this. And then last, what is the Etruscan legacy? Um, and as to the legacy, I don't conclude with any satisfactory answers. These answers are still, you know, to be found, I think, and it evolves with a more and more scholarship. So what I leave you with um, are a couple of images. And this is a third century uh, bronze uh, from Volterra that's called Ombra de, de la Serra and all. So that's from Etrus, um, <clears throat> Etruria. So you tell me if there's any kind of a legacy here. And then this is uh, Giacometti's uh, Femme de Bou. And that is a bronze from 1960 uh, CE. And with that, thank you for your time. Great job. No, amazing job, Lisa. Appreciate thank you. Thank you very much. much. Yeah. You're Lisa, welcome. It was fun. Yes, oh, a question. Uh, yes. I, recall, I recall being told that gladiator combat was an Etruscan tradition. Have they confirmed? Do they, did you see that? Do you believe that? Uh, I did not in the research I was doing. I did not come across any references to that. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that. I do not know. If it was Sabines or Etruscans, they say they were using it during the funerary processions. There was a gladiatorship of fights. They were not used for entertainment. It was it was to commemorate somebody dying. Yeah, I, I knew it was. A, I knew it was supposed. It's supposed to be a funerary thing. But yeah, okay. I, um... One thing that Romans uh, took after Etruscans is the chariot races. That mm -hmm. was the Etruscan thing. Okay. I, mean, I got. I got to say, the the documentation on 
Etruscans and Etruria is really tremendously thin. Hmm. And uh, there's an awful lot of wishful thinking uh, and, and um, um, uh, excessively creative construction put on this. Um, the, the overwhelming cultural impact on both the Etruscans and the Romans or the Greeks. Uh, I think that um, really interestingly, many of the, um, uh, the pots that you showed, Lisa, I showed also in my presentations on Greek black figure art, which is to say that they're claimed by both sides. Right, and as you, you, you go to books of, of Greek art and you'll see those same pieces claimed as being Proto-Corinthian and so forth and so on. And there certainly have been, um, uh, I mean, there was, uh, you know, a, a big blow, uh, brouhaha in Etruscan studies when uh, I think in the 30s, they proved that a, a whole bunch of, of pottery that they had thought was Etruscan were actually Athenian imports. And you did mention how the Athenians uh, tailored their output for the Etruscan market, which uh, is clear. The, um, the painting, paintings of the school of the diver are claimed as Greek. The pictures inside are just a typical Greek symposium scene. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to get too much further on that, but I'm saying that there's a huge amount of of questioning uh, of how much of this Etruscan stuff is based on circular logic, you know, and and, and then uh, so once you say, well, the, the the Etruscans conquered Rome, then you say, well, this this and this, they they must have happened because the Etruscans brought it to them because they dated around the period when they then say that the Etruscans conquered Rome. And when you pull one piece out of the edifice, the whole thing falls down. Yeah. Well, when you talk about seven kings, it's way the Roman, we talk about the seven Roman kings. What was that, what was the time, what time period was that across? Well, that, that there's controversy there too. I yeah. mean, the, the, the um, I think the date What's the date for the establishment of the Republic? Is it right Five, around? 509. 509. So, okay. the, the last three kings of Greece, oh, I'm sorry, of Rome, occupy a period of about 110 years, according to that chronology. That is pretty much impossible, certainly in the ancient world. Um, well, thought, by Louis the 13th, 14th. I'm saying by single individual yeah. kings, yes, but to get three yeah. in a row, yeah. Right, that each have reigns in that thirty-five year. I mean, it's it's just it's it's not credible. Okay. Um, well, the French yeah, had yeah. four kings from sixteen thirty to about seventeen ninety. So it's not. Well, well, the whole thing. Yeah. Is Given the fact that these, these kings were overthrown in coups, they didn't die a natural death. Oh, uh, okay, that makes it trickier. Yeah. Yeah, they're all legendary, right? In, in that period, seven, we, we don't know who, who really found the, uh, the, the, Rome. The, yeah, I mean, the, 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 what the scholars say is that what is, uh, what is um, important and historical in these old stories are the institutions, mm -hmm. right? So when they talk about uh, assemblies and um, uh, the construction of temples and and things that are basically institutions, uh, uh, the you know the census, the the tribes, the centuries, that that's really historical. That's genuine stuff. But the yeah. individuals that they ascribe it to are folk tales, and uh, that, and that's I mean I I I, I certainly am convinced by that. Well, I was going to make actually I was going to make a comment make a comment you were showing that little model of the church if you visit toronto and you visit toronto's art gallery in the basement there's a whole bunch of shit models um back in the day they didn't have cad they didn't really have drafting if somebody's going to build you a ship or a building they made a model of it and they presented it to you and say here's how we're going to do it and i think in the case of brutal he actually had to demonstrate how they're going to do the dome 
so yeah, little what little models this look, time. What what you might be looking at is somebody's proposal to for a temple, mm -hmm. which is probably a, probably made of wood. Well, they 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 yeah. certainly yeah. had these you know in they they certainly had these little hut shaped things in many mm -hmm. graves. Yeah, right. That was really very common grave goods. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I couldn't help but notice that those engraveal uh, structures look like yurtas. So yeah, yeah, doesn't it? They did. They actually no. See, this is kind of interesting because they do find that there is a distinction between male and female funerary urns and all um de definitely and so there is like you know kind of reference to genitalia in a, in a way um in some of them yeah well actually the greeks codified it by they had what they were called belly amphora and shoulder amphora which had to do with where the handles are so if the handles are on the wide part of the pot that's a belly amphora those were used for female in interments and shoulder M for, uh, for where the uh, handles yeah. went from the, the shoulders of the pot up to the lip, those were used for male burials. Yeah. And then I, I remember Lisa pointed out that women were on the same level as men. And it was particularly very scandalous, especially for Rome and Greeks. The women were drinking in public in Etruria. <laughs> which was like a no, no, you know, Ro uh, Romans, uh, obviously, all we know is mixed the uh, wine with water and the, it was mostly male procession. And here you have all these paintings, women drinking in public in Anchuria. So there, it's, it's an interesting fact. I, I would <laughs> suspect that that's just following the Greek, uh, can, that those were prostitutes. Those were not their wives. Those were hetari. Those were the high class prostitutes that attended at symposia that were very cultured that could sing that would play musical instruments and and carry on enlightened conversation they understood they knew philosophy and uh, they were the ones that were seen you know drinking and consorting with men and the the women were at home you know uh doing the the uh the the spinning and the weaving and the sewing and staying you know, protect it so that they could make sure who, who was the father of their children. Yeah, but that was so, Greek. We don't know that the Etruscans were different. But uh, the point is, I'm, but I'm saying we don't know that these pictures were actually executed by, by, by Etruscans. Hmm. We have so much Greek export art. I'm curious about, I'm curious so, about hoplites. There were real consequences to hoplite war in ancient Greece. And similar military attacks in Rome, the, the monarchies collapsed because they needed massed armies. They built massed armies and they couldn't get keep them in line, which is where Roman democracy, sorry, where Greek and Roman democracy and republics came up. Um, I, I, the Romans held a political meeting. Everybody put on a suit of armor, picked up a spear and shield and marched off to the plane of Mars that demonstrated he was allowed to vote. Um, I would wonder how that affect the Etrurians. Can you, can you maintain can you maintain efficient formation like that? The whole point of those poplite formations is that they're big. There's a significant proportion of your citizens involved in it. I mean, you guys, so what you what I was you. reading was that the Etruscans were not organized like the Greeks or the Romans. You know, again, they were like more city states, um, and yeah. they did not have the structure well, the um, and the discipline. You know, the, the, yeah. the, I think they're all city states initially anyway, but the point, right. are not yeah. the, but the point right. is that, that there's, you know, there's so little documentation on hoplites actually fought. I mean, there, there, there are, there are shelves in the library arguing about hoplite tactics for the Greeks. So there's no documentation at all for the Etruscans. I love yeah. watching the yeah. videos from Lindy Beige, I think it goes over some of that stuff. He's questioning whether they held the spears overhand. That's right. Um, but the other, another possibility is they were hiring Greek mercenaries. I mean, you know, it, the point is if you're in a hoplite battle, if you're disorganized, you're getting slaughtered. You're, you're better off just surrendering. Lisa, but, actually, uh, the if, question if we... of how you hold the spear has to do with the fact that, uh, well, some of it comes from reenactors. The reenactors have discovered that if you hold the spear like this, you reach arm exhaustion so fast. Hmm. Uh, and you also could not, I mean, you, you, you have to strike somebody who's so close to you because of the angle that the underarm action actually allows you to thrust 
and get an extension. The spear is an extension weapon. The whole idea is that the spear lets you attack an enemy before he can get to you with his sword. Hmm. And so a lot of that, as I say, comes from these practical uh, experiments by reenactors. And then there are scholars who say, well, you know, that the a lot the the um, spears that are being held overhead are actually javelins. They're not thrusting spears. They're designed to be thrown, as you you know, as as in Homer. Okay. Homer is throwing. I can, can I we return to the Etruscans yeah. uh, because okay. we're going into sideways. Yeah. You know, because there are still a lot of interesting things. Because if the Etruscans uh, uh, were their height in the sixth and seventh century BCE, I mean, there is nothing like that uh, in uh, 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 around, uh, about the other Italic tribes. You know, they were definitely uh, way ahead of anyone, even Greeks. Uh, we're not, uh, uh, they, they were just starting colonizing, you know, like in uh, uh, at, at the time. So they had some, so they were like almost on equal terms in terms of influence. Uh, I, th I think it's very interesting. By the way, you hear me well now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. we do. Well, I, 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 really, I, I, really, I really disagree with that. I think it was the, yeah. when the Greeks started, the, the first Greek colonies are around 750 BC in uh, Ischia, Pithecusae around um, uh, in, the, in the Bay of yeah, Naples, yeah. and then yeah. they, they formed Kumai. And you can see that all of the, uh, you know, uh, Greek style archaeological remains are all dating from that point in time, as well as the, the alphabet, um, you know, it, Lisa mentioned the Eubians, the Eubians had a specific, the, well, the, the, this these these first colonies were formed by the Eubians. They were the people who colonized uh, Pithecusae, and there was, you know, they they were they were there in search of metals, and so they were specifically right. trading with the Tuscans, who had access to all the metals, and that's where the 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 first exposure came. But they didn't colonize Etruria because the uh, no, they Greek. didn't because they were resisted. The you yeah, know the, the Etrurians so, had enough enough uh cohesion and mass to be able to keep them out but you know so the greeks said okay we'll trade right so it's, i'm just saying that at that time when just colonization started you're talking about then the each uh you know the first one the first colonization uh, but that's early but it's mostly greek colonization is only going into this like seventh century this is this is the height of a uh, Etruscan period so they already were very developed. And this is the time when Rome supposedly they already, uh, Rome existed. I, I don't know how much, uh, uh, because, because it's existed before uh, the original date of foundation, 753, because there are archeologically, there are settlements there on the Palantine Hill in the ninth century BC. So, uh, I, I mean, it, we, we have, of course, uh, all the, uh, uh, legendary stories, uh, which is I find very interesting, uh, but uh, historically uh, we really don't know. But certainly, no other Italic tribes were on that level. We don't find anything like uh, Umbrians or Latins or uh, Sabians. Yeah, well, they didn't. They didn't have the wealth, you know. I mean, they didn't have access to to those precious metals that they were that they the Etruscans were mining. There are scholars who claim. Who, who basically say that it is a fact that the material culture of the Romans and the Etruscans in that early period is indistinguishable. You cannot tell whether it's a, a, a Roman archeological site or an Etruscan archeological site, their material culture is identical. So it's, it's, it's not accepted by all of the, the scholars that, that the Etrurians were much in advance of the, of the Romans. Quite the opposite. They, they, they are, the, the theory is that there, there was a lot of a lot of cross pollination. There were, you know, ethnic uh, Etrurians in in Rome, as, uh, ethnic Etruscans in Rome. There were that that went in both directions. There were Greeks. There were Phoenicians. It was a whole big mix. But the overwhelming uh, source of of the new ideas was from the Greeks. Right. Uh, so the the fact that 
um, Etruscans uh, were committed, I mean, Romans committed genocide against Etruscans is out of the window. So they were just basically merged into Roman society, um, as Lisa had pointed out. So, I mean, I, uh, initially before this presentation, I was under the impression they, they might have eliminated them altogether. That, that was not my that was not my understanding. Um, a lot of this is is really based on, you know, that there was this cross pollination and there was this this merging of of cultures um, and there was a lot of borrowing and a lot of giving. Um, so it wasn't um, as I guess cut and dry um, as maybe I thought when I was going into this. I think that by the time there was a social wars and when uh, eventually uh, the citizenship was extended to all Italic, uh, all Italy in the first century BC. I mean, that's the time when uh, probably Etr Etruscans uh, kind of uh, diminished, uh, their culture became uh, indistinguishable. And from what I understand, the language became instinct. Uh, 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 disappeared at the beginning of the first century AD. Uh, and I've read that uh, Emperor Claudius, who was one of the most educated uh, people of his time, supposedly knew the Trotskan language, uh, unlike anybody else. I mean, there were very few people by that time. He who definitely knew studied that. it. He definitely researched it. Yeah. They, yeah, they say the it interesting was already... thing about Claudius was that he was a historian who became emperor, right. as opposed yeah, to yeah, an emperor yeah. who dabbled in history. Right. But it was already non -existent. Nobody spoke it uh, as a, as a uh, native tongue uh, by that time. Uh, but that, that's helping. That's helping elsewhere. Though, look at look at English history. Uh, uh, there was some lovely thing. There's some place in Wales that's named Hill, 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 Hill because they kept translating the language, and the people speaking it didn't realize it was a word for hill. It's like the Avon. The word Avon is a Celtic word for river. So when you talk the Avon River, you're calling it the River River. I, I guess like I, somebody, in, somebody in Texas saying, "Where's the real river?" Um, yeah. You can you guess. Know, what I, have a, I have a I have a really interesting question. Why? You know, because it's very unique that they retain this like non-European language and uh, all the other examples in Europe, like uh, uh, Basques and uh, uh, Raetian uh, language, those people, they lived in a mountain and you could see how they could resist the uh, infiltration of the Indo-European uh, uh, steppes uh, uh, kind of uh, tribe. Uh, but uh, uh, Etruscans, uh, unless, and I'm just thinking, they didn't live in the mountains when we knew, like Etruria is not necessarily a mountainous area. And I'm just thinking, how did they resist that influence, unlike others who were like mountain people? Unless, I'm, I'm thinking, maybe they lived in the Apennines and then descended later on with their own language. Maybe um, we underestimate how militarily tough they were. No, no, we're talking about the three. The, the, they, they probably didn't exist uh, as a culture uh, at the time of the uh, uh, Indo-European migration. We're talking about like maybe two thousand years BC. I mean, uh, uh, I'm talking about how did they retain the language? How did they uh, this? How did that happen? Because in the well, I know I, I know the, the Basque the Basque are more mountain people and everything, right. but they resisted. They still resist, right? Yeah, because they're in the mountains, it's easier to yeah. resist in the mountains. Yeah. But yeah. They, that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know, Raetian language. This is in the Alps. Also, I can understand how those islands could be untouched, but Etruscans are not in the mountain. Yeah. How did yeah. they resist? That I don't understand. Oh. And they're yeah. interacting a lot with um, other people that are going to be speaking other languages, like the Greeks, uh, you know, uh, the Phoenicians, and all. So, what was kind of like their lingua franca, I guess, um, of trade? Yeah, I mean, presume Greek, but I, I don't know. Yeah. And they didn't find anything in Carthage as far as a translation, you said, Lisa, right? Nothing. Yeah, I know. So there are, I think, I think there are three main texts that have been found. One is that linen wrapping. Another was uh, found on that e, uh, island of Lem Lemnos, um, an archaic Etruscan inscription. 
And then the third was found like a, it looks like it's a, a land deed or something that was cut up into eight pieces. Um, and those are the longest texts that have been found that have to, that were written in Etruscan. One interesting thing that they found is that they have identified uh, words in Etruscan. All of the pottery shapes are the Greek words. Oh, interesting. All, all of the pottery shapes in Etruscan are adaption of the, the Greek words for a calyx and a crater. And, crater and amphora. And, right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. There's actually um, a kind of an interesting documentary. It was on the BBC, but the quality of the video, at least on YouTube, was really bad. Um, and it follows basically some French um, uh, underwater archaeologists that discovered a um, um, a wreck, a shipwreck, a Etruscan shipwreck off the coast of Marseille. Uh, and it actually, you know, films them as they're like uncovering the remains and the amphora that were filled with wine, no longer filled with wine, but there is evidence that there was wine. And they actually were able to find like the ribs of the structure and see that the, the ship was put together, you know, not with uh, machines or nails, but it was a, kind of like, like a layered together, you know, oh. woven together the wood. Uh, really fascinating uh, documentary if you guys can Well, there was it. a joke that is the first time that French would have been pissed that the Italians or Etruscans were exporting wine to Gaul. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not... <laughs> well, think about it. Med breast, you, you're talking a ship, you know, brass, bronze nails, that's expensive as hell. Yeah, if yeah. You can weave a ship I together. You know. you know, it's interesting because they didn't talk about any, uh, you know, nails that were used. They talked about kind of like this. Uh, I, I can't remember the term for Mortis it, but um, what's that? Mortis and tenon joints. Mortis, yeah. 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 So um, that, that's what they, they found. Um, and also. Any cultures that we know are trying to link themselves to Etruscans? Hmm? Any to, what? Any cultures that we know are trying to link themselves to Etruscans? Well, the, uh, the uh, Tuscany, right? I mean, Tuscany is Etruscan um, and all. So I would assume that there is definitely, you know, kind of like a nationalist pride and right, 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 right. relating to the Etruscans. Um, but I, 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 don't, I don't know. Yeah. I can't see why anybody outside Italy would do it. Yeah, I thought they were pretty cool. I'd want to be in an Etruscan, you know, if I have my choice. <laughs> they were, according to Greeks, they were partying, they were pirates. Yeah, they were, they were, yeah, yeah. People lucky, you know? Yeah, Greeks, yeah, yeah. Greeks didn't have much good to say about anybody who wasn't Greek. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay when the Greeks did it. But it's yeah. interesting to me, the, the origination somehow, and we know Herodotus was always exaggerating, but how did he even connect Lydians to Etruscans? I just don't get that. I, yeah, well, I don't. Because, uh, of the, because of the uh, uh, Lemnus, you know, the yeah. island of Lemnus. It's right there, right off the coast of, um, uh, uh, coast of Anatolia. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about the Herodotus, how he thought. Yeah. Yeah. How did he connect that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard well, to say. Forget. I mean, he connected a lot of things. He can't really trust him. I mean, he unfortunately was missing a lot of information we have right now. You cannot rely, uh, you know, on the ancient historians uh, and, and with it, regards to. Uh, it's not to blame him. I mean, that was what that was what the Greeks did. You know, they would they would see something and say, "Oh, yes, this is just like something from their history," and they would impose their history and culture. But it's well, interesting. Lydian you know, was not in the that's world. kind of the origin of syncretism. So you said that the gods were different, mm -hmm. right? Because they would maintain some of their local features, but they were mightily influenced. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right, yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, yeah. just the whole idea of having an anthropomorphic deity. Yeah, is, that, is, was, is that was Greek. That was definitely yeah, a Greek import. Certainly Greek uh, influenced uh, uh, everyone uh, in Europe. <laughs> you know, they were the, the main, you know, influence. And possibly, of, of the, you know, in this old period, the key influence that the Greeks had was uh, the city-state. The idea of a, of a, of a uh, public institutions uh, as opposed to 
um, warlordism, which was probably what preceded it. And you still see signs of, of that in the, in the old sources of individual Romans carrying on private wars, the Fabii family against the Etruscans, uh, um, the Claudius family who brought his whole private army into Rome and became uh, a citizen and was consul the next year. So, you know, it was really uh, the, the previous um, uh, culture was one of, of uh, you know, of, of warlords with uh, followings and, and, and so forth and interacting. And it was their coming together as a, as a, as a civic institution was the, the big idea they got from the Greeks. And well, also the basic, alphabet, the basic. alphabet. Okay. They, brought, they brought the writing system and, into and, Europe, and, right? You can say that, it, on that Rome in particular had to be literate in order to form a, a, a city-state because of their unique institutions required writing. You can't conduct a census without being able to write. And that's like the, early, you know, they give, they, they credit that to uh, Tullius Servus. Hmm who essentially, you know, created Roman citizenship. Well, watch it. I'm reading up on, uh, I have his name. Um, oh, the Indian guy. I should know, it should be a tip of my tongue. But basically the guy that invented the Cherokee alphabet did not speak English and he could not read English. He just understood they were doing it. And so he figured out how he should do it. I'm wondering, is it possible the Etruscan language is spoken by a small ruling class? You mean that it wasn't consistent with um, throughout? It was just the aristocratic yeah, that he's spoke Etruscan? Yeah, an ordinary working class person living in Etruscan would speak the local Indo-European language. I don't know. Anyway, guys. I mean, the, the bottom line yeah. is that there's just such little documentation yeah. mm -hmm. about yeah. things like that. Yeah. That, you know, and, and in, in all the ancient world, the documentation of of anybody beneath the arist 